Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning to students who are online. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer. We'll get into our session. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you once again for this opportunity to come together, Lord, and to learn. And even as we sit at your feet, Lord, we pray that you will teach us, you will reveal your word to us in clarity. Lord, minister to our hearts, oh God. We just submit this two hours into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so last class we looked at chapter 9. Yes? We looked at the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And most importantly, we focused on two important points, right? That is the aspect of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. That is when you and I become believers, the Holy Spirit comes, resides in us. And then there's the aspect of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit begins to release gifts into our lives to be fruitful in ministry, right? So we answer those important questions on uh, praying in tongues, right? Is it good to pray in tongues? Yes. Should we pray in tongues every time? Yes. Should we desire to pray in tongues? Is, is it a language that we can understand? Very good. Okay. Can we pray together in tongues when we are gathered in a group? What about praying with unbelievers? Oh. <laughs> You're ready. Okay, let's get into chapter 10. Chapter 10, uh, we're just going to look at the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Let's begin by reading what are those nine gifts i think some of you have i hope all of you have learned all the nine gifts who can tell me all the nine gifts without seeing go ahead take the mic and say it what are the nine gifts of the holy spirit in the meanwhile as he's saying this open to first corinthians 12 1 to 11. what's your name okay nasi go ahead without looking nine gifts of holy spirit word of wisdom Word of knowledge, faith, prophecy, healing, miracles, discernment, uh, tongues, tongues interpretation. Done, correct? Very good. How many of you know this? How many, oh, what about the others? Everyone know it? Some of you are hiding. Okay, but you should learn this, right? Okay, let's get into 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 through 11. Now, before we get into there, let me just paint for you a picture of what's happening in this church. Paul goes to the church in Corinth in a second missionary journey. He plants a church there. Now, there are two kinds of people. One is you've got the Jews who, are, who believe in Jesus, and you've got Gentiles who are living a very sinful life, but all of a sudden they become believers. So you've got a mixed group of people. And Corinth was a place known for idol worship, right? Idol worship, sexual immorality. This was a common, common ritual or common religion that was happening there. So if a person goes to a prostitute, right? It's not like a sin. It's like going to one of the goddesses who belong to God, right? So it's not a sin. Prostitution, sexual immorality. Um, uh, idol worship, all of this was all right. It was not a sin. Now, Paul has gone there and he has planted a church. And this church, we've got some believers, but something very powerful is happening in this church. What is it? They're already flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. Some people are prophesying, some people have word of knowledge, some are, you know, praying for healing. Healing is happening. All the gifts are flowing. But you know, in the midst of all of this, there's confusion. So Paul is writing here. He's basically telling them, listen, there are nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, but we must understand how to flow in these gifts. Right? We may be a good musician, but we may not have song dynamics. Example, I may know how to play everything on the guitar or keyboard, whatever it is. But when you're playing in a band, the song dynamics change completely. I can't play everything I know. 
I must know what to play, when to play, and how to play it. You get what I'm saying? Right? The gift is there. The skill is there. But when you're playing with a band, I cannot do whatever I want to do. I must know what to do when. There are times I shouldn't sing. There are times I should play very softly. There are times I should build up and play strong. There are times I should let the backing vocalists sound better, sound stronger. Sometimes I should I should go strong on melody. The worship leader should do that. Right? So when you look at a song, there's so many details in it. The same way, when the Holy Spirit comes, he comes with these nine gifts, but we must understand how to use those nine gifts. If, if there's an instrument, if I don't know how to use this keyboard that is here, what will happen? I'll keep playing things. It may not be in tune. But if I know this keyboard, I've understood, I've played with it for over two or three years, there's some kind of understanding. I know when to play loud, when to play soft. Right? So let's look at, this is the background, right? In the church in Corinth. Believers, people from the Jews and the Gentiles, they're coming together. And now there's a problem. The gifts are there, but they are not using it effectively. It's not used in a proper manner. So Paul is writing. Let's read. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. A, know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore, I give unto the understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus assured, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are uh, devices of gifts, but, but the same gift, and there are different of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diverse sides of operation, but it is the same God which works. Uh, just read it in the mic, no? Go ahead, keep reading it. So, from verse 8, uh, for to one who is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to an other, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of Spirit, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation, interpretation of tongues, but one and the same Spirit works all these things distributing to each one individually as he wills for as the body is one and has many members but all the members of the one body being many are one body also. no no that's fine only up to verse 12. okay now go back to the first few verses right it says you know that when you were pagan somehow or or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols now, go, keep going down. I tell you that no one who's speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is Lord, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. Now, just stay there for a while. There are different kinds of gifts. How many? There are nine gifts. All the nine gifts are given by the same Holy Spirit. There is no different Holy Spirits for different gifts. And I'm sure we know that, right? The Holy Spirit being the third person in the Trinity comes with these gifts and it is the same Spirit. So one person may be flowing very, you know, very powerfully in a prophetic, whereas another person may be flowing very powerfully in the word of knowledge. Another person may be flowing very, uh, you know, very strong in working of miracles, while another person may be very strong in the gift of faith. 
but it's the same Holy Spirit. So what does it teach us? Teaches us something very important. When you look at a bigger picture, it is the same Holy Spirit giving us these gifts, and there is no competition. Uh, have you heard of the saying, Potter envies Potter? Uh, not always this happens, but most of the time, if a pastor meets a pastor, sometimes there's a problem. Not from the chain church, other church. How many people in your church? 100. We have 500. <laughs> Now, this guy is getting worried. 500 you have. When do you start it? 2005. 2005. Only 100 people. Yeah. I started 2015. Porter envies Porter. Porter is not worried about Carpenter. You get what I'm saying? You're understanding what I'm saying. Now, we must understand that the Holy Spirit is given to us to build the body of Christ. We'll look at, uh, look at some more of it later. But there is no competition. Just because God is doing something in another ministry in a certain way doesn't mean that, that we cannot go. We, we are doing something that is unfruitful. No. It's the same Holy Spirit that is working in all of us, in all the churches, in all the ministries. Again, there's an aspect of us desiring more. But let's look at the nine gifts. First one, the word of wisdom. What is wisdom? What is wisdom? Tell me. What, what do you think? What is, what is wisdom? The ability to make good decisions, yes? I mean, you're saying something? Understanding. Oh, some, somebody was saying something here. Knowledge. Yeah, I won't put you into... Uh, sorry, what is that? Word of God. Having a revelation. What? What did you say? Knowing about God. Very good. Now, I'll give you a simple yet a, a simple way to understand what knowledge, what wisdom is. Wisdom is the right application of knowledge. Say that, everyone. Wisdom is the right application of knowledge. Knowledge is when you see the, you know in your mind, red light means stop. That is knowledge. Wisdom is to stop. You see red light and keep going, that is what? Foolish. This is just an example, right? In the scriptures, we see Jesus. He was filled with wisdom and knowledge. So a word of wisdom gets into the heart of matters. There are times, OK, let's read Matthew chapter 22, 15 through 22. Very, very powerful passage. Matthew 22, 15 through 22. Read. This is when Jesus is questioned. See the wisdom in his answer. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entice him uh, in, his walk, in his thought. And they sent to him their disciples with the, the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of man. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus uh, perceived their weak weakness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a dinar, dinaris, and he said to them, Whose image and inscription in this? They said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render, the, uh, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. 
when they had heard these words they marvel and left him and when they were yeah now we know this we know this portion right whose coin give me a coin who whose face do you see on this caesar's give to caesar what belongs to caesar give to god what belongs to god a word of wisdom gets into the heart of man what does the verse say jesus knew what they were thinking they were trying to trap jesus they were not asking jesus because they wanted to know they were asking because they wanted to trap jesus and jesus through the word of wisdom by the holy spirit says give to caesar what belongs to caesar give to god what belongs to god now what about us there will be times in our ministry or in what we are doing there are two roads and sometimes we don't know what road to take i remember this long time back it was in the year 2013 13 i could be right 13 so i was leading worship at central and at that sunday i don't know if i've shared this but i'm going to share this that sunday um a very prestigious college i leave it unnamed from the United States, they had come to uh, APC and they were doing, uh, you know, they were just talking about their Bible college, right? And they wanted to just uh, uh, make sure, like uh, like bringing invitations for people to join their Bible college. So they, they gave them about 10 minutes to share about their Bible college and they had a table where they were giving out applications for those interested. This is for United States. Now I finished worship, finished the whole set, and um, after the whole service, the dean, that was the principal of the Bible college, came up to me and said, I will pay for you and for your family. Three years, fully paid course. I will do the visa, I'll do everything for you. Come to the US and study. Does it sound good? Very nice. I was very happy. The moment she said that, I wanted to say yes. Immediately, the Holy Spirit said, say no. Now, that's the most difficult part. I thought, is that Satan telling me to say no? <laughs> say no. Why? They said they'll give free education. Three years free. Plus, a stay is free. Plus, you'll get opportunity to you know, lead worship, all of that. Serve in, the, in, their, look, in their church. Everything is good. I don't have to do anything. The spirit in my heart said, say no. Now, I was very afraid. I was thinking, should I say, how do I say this? So I, I said, see, thank you so much for the invitation, but I'm not interested. She said, why are you not interested? See, I am interested. Holy Spirit is not interested. I don't mind coming. Uh, Holy Spirit is not interested. And she said, okay, what about next year? No. The Holy Spirit is very clearly telling no. Now, I don't know why. Is life good there? Very good. But when the Holy Spirit releases some things in our life, there is a reason for it. There is wisdom in the way he releases his ideas and plans in our life. And I believe that God has put me here back in India, and I'm happy that I'm here because there's so much that I learned here. I'm not saying I wouldn't have learned that, but God wanted me here. Right? Do I get opportunities? I do get opportunities I to go all over different countries. If I check my mail, I've got five, six opportunities already in different countries. Not interested. Why? Because the Holy Spirit gives us, now I'm not saying you don't go. If you get opportunities, you pray and go. But there's a wisdom that God gives us to step into certain places and not to step into certain places. And many a times as believers, we step into places we don't have to step into and we end up in trouble. And then we say, God, where are you? God says, I told you not to go, you went. Now. That's why we need the spirit of wisdom. When God gives us the wisdom, we know we don't look at things in the natural. We're making decisions based on the wisdom of God. 
God, should I do this? Is this something that you want me to do? And so we tap into the Holy Spirit. And he gives us the wisdom. You do this, but don't do this now. Right? There will be times in your life, in your ministries, many of you want to start churches or start ministries, start a work, job opportunities that you're looking for. You will have to make a decision. Eventually, you will have to make a decision. You can't go to your parents every time. Should I join a job? Your parents will beat you up and say, go join. I've been telling you that past five years. But which job to join? You have three opportunities. Which job to join? So you need the wisdom of God. God, give me the wisdom. Sometimes wisdom is only listening. No need to speak. Just listen. Just try to understand what the situation is. Many times there were confusions, or if there's, you know, in 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 church there will be people who are angry or upset. They come and they talk to us. You know, why did this happen? Why did this happen? Now, wisdom is to just keep quiet and listen. Sometimes you don't have to give an answer. Just stay quiet. And that's where the spirit of wisdom comes in. Two is a word of knowledge. John chapter 1, 43 to 40, 51. John 1, 43 to 51. Now, we, we, are, we looked at this briefly in a Lifestyle Evangelism. Mm -hmm. Uh, where Jesus meets Nathaniel and he says this. Okay, we'll not read the whole thing, but through the word of knowledge, what did Jesus say? When Verse 47, when Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said to him, here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me, Nathaniel asked. Jesus answered, look at the word of knowledge. I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Two things are happening here. Jesus is seeing Nathaniel and he's saying, here is an Israelite whom there is no deceit in. And Nathaniel is saying, how do you know me? Jesus is saying, I saw you even before you, you while you were sitting under the fig tree, I saw you. Word of knowledge. Can you give me another example in the New Testament? Where? Give me an example. Anyone? Remember Peter? Ananias. Yes, Jeremiah. Sorry, sorry. Jeremiah, Jeremiah. Okay, Jeremiah. Okay. Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Jeremiah. Lord, lots of uh, word of knowledge. Um, Isaiah again, lot of word of knowledge. But in the New Testament, you remember Peter. When Ananias came, what did he say? Ananias, did you pay for the whole? Did you put the whole thing in? He said, "Yes." How can you lie to the Holy Spirit? Word of knowledge, right? And in many places, we see the we see in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, we see the word of knowledge. Samuel again, very very prophetically through word of knowledge. Yeah, you you should read that. I I hope I can get that. Let me just pull pull up that passage of scripture. Okay, go to 1 Samuel chapter 10. Now look at this. Powerful word of knowledge. Think of this. This is Old Testament. Okay, 1 Samuel chapter 10. Samuel is going to anoint King Saul as the king of Israel, the first king. Look what happens there. I'm going to read portions of it. 1 Samuel chapter 10. See, Samuel is talking to... Samuel took the flask of oil and poured it on Saul's head. Then verse 2, when you leave me today, you will meet two men near Rachel's tomb in the border of Benjamin. They will say to you, the donkeys you set out to look for have been found. And now your father has stopped thinking about them and is worried about you. He's asking, what shall I do about my son? Then you will go on from there until you will reach the great tree of Tabor. Three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you there. 
One will be carrying three young goats, another three loaves of bread, and another skin of wine. They will greet you and offer you two loaves of bread, which you will accept from them. After that, you will go to Gibeah of God, where there will be a Philistine post. As you approach the town, you will meet a procession of prophets coming down from the high place with lyres, tambourines, flutes, and harps played before them, and they will be prophesying. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you in power, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be changed into a different person. Look at this. This is not even there in the New Testament. Meaning this kind of detailed word of knowledge. What is he saying? Samuel is saying, see, when you go from here, two people will meet you. They will say, hey, your father is searching for you. He's not worried about the donkeys anymore. He's worried about you. Then you'll keep going. You'll meet three people. What they are carrying also, Samuel is saying. And as you go up, the, uh, go further on from them, you will see a group of people coming down, singing and uh, playing with the lyres and trumpets and praising God. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. You will begin to prophesy and you will be a changed person. Detailed prof word of knowledge. Now, remember, when you and I are ministering, we can flow in this word of knowledge. We can, really, because it's the same Holy Spirit. Right? A word of knowledge is basically a word that God is giving you about a person or about certain thing that is happening in their life. Now, why is the word of knowledge being given? It is given to bring exhortation to people, to the church. Now, I've heard of people, I've seen many videos where the people you know, they say, okay, your birthday is 13th February. Okay. So what should I do? What's the point? So what if you know my birthday? There should be a reason. A word of knowledge will always bring forth fruit. Everyone say that. A word of knowledge will always bring fruit. There will be something that God will do in, in the person's life. Imagine I pick, I'm going to pick Vinay, right? Vinay, your birthday is, I'm praying for Vinay, your birthday is 17th of January. He says, yeah, 17th of January. Okay, so what, 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 what should I do? And he's, Vinay is like, so what should I do, Pastor? You told me my birthday is just 17th of January. No, I just wanted to let you know. He'll say, I already know. Tell me, what is it? I know my birthday. I've been celebrating my birthday. What is it that God has revealed? Nothing. He only told me a birthday. Now, there's something wrong. Remember, when the Holy Spirit releases a word, it is a word of encouragement that will bring some change or some fruit. To Nathaniel, it was, at the end of that whole conversation, Nathaniel was saying, I know you're the Messiah. Here's Samuel. He's giving that whole word of knowledge. At the end, the Holy Spirit came upon him, and he was a changed man. So there has to be some fruit from a word of knowledge that we are giving. Elkanah asking, which Bible version are you reading? Okay, I'm reading the NIV version. It's called the Never Improved Version. Third one. Sorry, it's not the Never Improved. It's the New International Version. Okay. The Gift of Faith. Third one. The Gift of Faith. Now, let's read um, Luke chapter 7, 11 through 16. And it came to pass the day after that, he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples were with him, and much people. Now, when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother. She was a widow, and much people of the city was, was with her. And when the, Lord got, when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched her spear, and they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he, and he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear and all, and they glorified God, saying, That a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God yeah. has visited his people. Yeah. Now. Look at this. Jesus has just begun his ministry and he's walking in this gift of faith. 
the widow's son is dead. What does Jesus go and say? He says, don't be worried. Don't be worried. He goes and raises up this son from the dead. The gift of faith. There are many examples. When Jesus came, uh, you know, he, he walked on water. That's faith combined with the working of miracles. When Jesus said, remove that stone, we're going to bring Lazarus back from the dead. Gift of faith. He took those five loaves of bread and two fish. He saw thousands of people. He said, now go give it. Gift of faith. Remember, the gift of faith is always combined with some of the other gifts. We'll talk about that a little more later on. Now, you and I have the gift of faith. We have the faith. It's like a muscle. We, we learn, we're learning in faith, right? Faith is a muscle. If I want my muscles to be strong, I got to exercise it. And the more I exercise, the more stronger and the more flexible my body becomes. Right? Sometimes I play with my boy football, soccer. After 10 minutes, I'm sitting down. Why? I'm tired. This boy is going on playing. But I'm not used to playing soccer often. Faith is like a muscle. The more I exercise it, the more I walk in it, the more I'm able to function in it. It's there in each one of us. But we have to exercise it. Right? And there are many examples of gift of faith. When you look in the Old Testament, New Testament, faith. The Bible is a book of faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. All through, from Abraham. All the way till the end, till revelations, it's a book of faith. How do we know raptures happen? One small passage in the entire Bible, maybe 10 verses. We believe that and we're waiting for rapture. Why? Faith. Jesus spoke about heaven. I'm building mansions for you. Heaven is like this. Very few, very little details about heaven. But why do we believe it? Faith. Jesus said, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit. He's coming with all of this. How do we believe it? Faith. Remember, all the gifts of the Holy Spirit are released through faith. Okay? Next, let's go a little quicker. Working of, sorry, gift of healing. Acts 5, 14 and 16. Now, we won't go into that verse, but gift of healing. Right? So many healings. Every the gift of healing is, is a gift that God has given all of us. And we must begin to, you know, manifest those gifts now initially when i became a believer i used to see these people you know praying and they're getting healed i used to think god what is this i also want to do it i also want to pray for people i want to see people healed and it was as if the holy spirit was speaking to me then do what you have to do you want to do it but you're not stepping out in faith of course we do our you know the background work of praying reading god's word all of it but I want to see miracles. If I don't step out, it's not going to work out. right? So we have this gift of healing, and we begin to exercise it. Working of miracles, Matthew 17, um, 24 through 27. Let's read that, Matthew 17, 24 through 27. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Does not your master pray tribute? He said, Yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon, of whom do the kings of the earth take customs or tribute, of their own children or of strangers? Peter said unto him, Of strangers, Jesus said unto him, Then are the children free? Now, withstanding, let us let us should offend them. Go thou to sea and cast on hook and take up the fish and first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money and that take and give unto them for me and thee. Yeah. Now, the problem has come up here. They're asking Jesus, hey, did you pay your tax? Now, Jesus didn't say, do you know who I am? I made you. Jesus didn't say that. Let no, no one point a finger at us and our ministry. So here, Peter, what you do, you go, go fishing. The first fish you catch, open that fish, you'll find the money, go and pay the taxes. 
Now, a word working of miracles usually take place at a word of instruction. Remember the ten lepers? From far, they, they are shouting out, Lord, Jesus, please have mercy on us. Ten lepers. What does Jesus say? Don't come here. Go show yourself to the priest. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Working of miracles happened at a word of instruction. What did Jesus say? He, to the blind man, he spat on the ground, he took sand, put it on his eyes and said, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, think of this guy, this blind man. Pool of Siloam, that's uh, four kilometers from here. Can I go to this other place? Can I go to my house or can I go to my friend's house and wash in his uh, sink? What did Jesus say? Go to the pool and wash your eyes. And the moment he went and did it, he was able to see. Look at Peter and John. He said, silver and gold I don't have. Name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Word of instruction. This man who has never walked tries to stand up. He stands up. And he begins to jump and walk around and done. Usually, the work of miracles happen at a word of instruction. So when you and I are ministering, the Holy Spirit may release something. The Holy Spirit may tell you, you're praying for somebody. Say, see, there is something that God wants you to do. There's probably a sin in your life that God wants you to repent of. You change that. You repent of your sin. God will open a door for you. This is what God has for you. Now, that's the Holy Spirit asking you to do something, a word of instruction, right? Or sometimes it's unforgiveness. There are times, you know, uh, there's unforgiveness and we are blocking the blessings of God. So we are angry or upset with somebody. We are not able to forgive them. But, you know, maybe you are praying for somebody or somebody's praying for you and says, go and ask God for forgiveness. Ask God and you go ask forgiveness to the other person. The moment they do that, things change in their life. Why? Because it's a word of instruction. Now, when we talk about healing, it's not only physical healing. Some of us need emotional healing. Some of us need mental healing. Physically, we may be looking strong, fit, healthy. But in our mind, we are weak as ever. There's pain, there's sorrow, there's grief constantly. Some of the richest people in this world are living in constant pain, emotional pain. Physically, they're okay. Mind, body, mind and soul full of pain. So the working of miracles happen in a word of instruction. Even in um, Elijah and the widow at Zarephath, Elijah is a famine in the nation of Israel. And here is Elijah going to this widow who is not even a Jew. Going there and saying, listen, I'm hungry, make something for me. No, this is the last thing I have. We thought we'll just eat this last, make, make a few loaves of bread with this dough, eat it, and we're going to die. Elijah says, you first make it, give it to me. She gives it to him, and the next thing you know, her oil jars was full through a word of instruction. Right? Now, you may be praying for a miracle. God, I want to, you know, be a worship leader, songwriter in my life. Maybe some of you are praying that, right? Now, if you want that miracle to happen, what must we do? It's a word of instruction God is giving us. You say, okay, I must be able to read the word. I must be able to spend time in prayer. There are things that I must do in the practical to see it come forth in the spiritual. Okay? Next, prophecy. Forthtelling or foretelling. We all know what is prophecy. What is prophecy? Oh, sorry. Hearing from God and telling. Okay. Heart of God. Sorry. Predicting. Okay. Let me give you a simple phrase of what prophecy is. Prophecy is God speaking to man through man. Say that. Prophecy is God speaking to man through man. 
Now don't think women are out of this. Man meaning everyone. Okay? Prophecy is God speaking to somebody through somebody. And we've seen plenty of it. Prophecy is foretelling. It is usually about the future. Word of knowledge could be of something of the past or something that is already happening. Prophecy is always about the future. What God is going to do. Now, you will learn more on prophecy next time. Next, I think it'll, next year you'll learn on understanding the prophetic. But let me give you this example. If God gives us a prophetic word, don't add your own masala to it and deliver it. You understand what I'm saying? Now, remember, God gives us a word. We are earthly vessels. Now, we may add something to it. Now, you're making biryani. Wrong day to talk about biryani, but anyways, today's fasting prayer. You're making biryani, and you put all the masalas and all of it. And then suddenly somebody comes and says, hey, I've got extra masala. And does something in that. And then the food comes and it's like bitter. Can't even eat it. Now listen, prophecy, when God gives a word, just give it as it is. Let me give you an example. I'm going to choose Vinay because... Vinay doesn't take everything serious. So I go to Vinay. Vinay, God is telling me that you're going to start a church. Now, God has spoken to me saying, you're going to start a church. That's it. Nothing more. God is going to make you a pastor. That's the prophetic word. Clean word come from God. I give it. Now, adding masala is what you know. <laughs> Vinay. God has called you to be a pastor. God will give you 1,000 people in your church. Now, God is saying, I didn't say that. I said, you're going to be a pastor. God will give you 1,000 people. And in that 1,000 people, you will build a church which is 5,000-seater auditorium. And you will start coming on TV. You will start coming on radio. People will come and open doors for you. They'll make you sit in the red carpet. Now, I didn't say all that. Now, God is saying, I didn't say all that. I said he will start a church. It may be 10 people. It may be 100 people. It may be 500 people. I didn't say all of that. I said, start a church. You do what I tell you to tell you. Don't add your own masala. Don't add your own things to it. Now, that's the problem that we have. God gives a word. Just give it. Now, there will be times a prophetic word can come in a dream or a vision. Like I can be praying for somebody. And as I'm praying, I may see a picture. Right? So, example, I'm praying for Vinay. I see a picture of a train going up and down. I say, so uh, God is calling you for a ministry. And I know that. But here's the picture that I'm seeing. I'm seeing trains, railway tracks and trains going up and down. So what is it? So here's what I feel, Vinay. Vinay, I feel that God is calling you to a ministry where you may have to travel to places. God will open doors because you're traveling. I see trains going up and down. So you pray about it and see what God has for you. See if that is God, what, what God ministers to you. And I'm leaving it at it. I'm not saying, see, I see trains are going up and down. You're going to become the owner of Indian Railways. Now what will happen? Vinay will say, I don't want to become owner of Indian Railways. Right? So it's about how we give the prophetic word, we be clear, and we know that we should not add anything to it. You know why we add things to it? So that everyone says, oh, Prophet Aya. Prophet Aya, wo sab dekhega. He'll know everything. No. There are times, like First Samuel 15, God can give those words of knowledge, a prophetic word to do this. Many times, he may just give you one word. Give it and be done with it. Your work is done. Like Ananias. Go to Paul, pray for him. That's all your work is. I didn't tell you, tell Paul you're going to do first missionary journey, second missionary journey, third missionary journey, then you'll be arrested, you'll write three, four letters, and the whole world will talk about your letters. I didn't say all that. 
go pray for him he will receive his eyesight end of story get what i'm saying right so prophecies are very important in how we deliver it seventh one discerning of spirit, spirits discern is to see into now people come with different attitudes there will be different people you will be ministering to right and you can see through people say god god gives you this discerning of spirit and you know okay this person will be great for the ministry or this person needs some more time or this other person no he's got his own personal agenda so god gives us that spirit of discernment to understand what is happening and especially in leadership we need the spirit of discernment to understand okay to make decisions okay should i choose this person or should i do this at this time right the spirit of discernment then diverse gift kinds of tongues we talked about that different kinds of tongues some can be tongues for personal benefit some can be tongues for uh, you know for prophetic prophetic words or anything right tongues in other languages there are different kinds of tongues and then finally ninth one is the interpretation of tongues now this is not very common especially like like what we see around us not very common but just because it's not common doesn't mean god cannot do it right remember the gift is there in us the holy spirit is there now i have personally never interpreted tongues for anyone because i've never got the interpretation now i'm not sitting and crying about it what i have what i have i'll multiply so god i thank you. you you give me a prophetic word give me a word of knowledge in the future i'm going to keep asking god god give me this thing maybe one day i will be able to interpret tongues and understand what somebody is praying and deliver a message that can help or bless the body of christ right if i don't have it right now doesn't mean that i'm not going to flow in it right so whatever we are flowing on you take it you you multiply with what you have right so these are the nine gifts we'll come back after the break and we'll quickly look at the proper foundation for releasing the gifts right all right let's take a break we'll come back